talk has been informed by a couple of round tables around at the Computer Applications Archaeology Conference in last Easter in Siena and at the EAA in Glasgow. Uh, and it's very much compiling the thoughts from various contributors, particularly out at the continent, so it shows sufficiently. Uh, the introduction slide is in Kilda, which is a dual UNESCO World Heritage Site for its natural and cultural heritage. It's a reminder that the archaeology and cultural heritage doesn't sit in, in isolation. It works in conjunction with the natural environment, ecology, and all these uh, stakeholders have an interest in that, that data. So we need to share our information with a wide range of users. <coughs> So, uh, as archaeologists, we create a wide range of uh, um, data from field survey, excavation, all the primary information that we gather. We've heard a bit, bit about that from Sweden, about the need to gather that information. That creates the evidence base, which we then use to inform, make our decisions to decide which monuments we statutorily protect or just include in a register. So it's very important to capture the information to form the evidence base. <coughs> However, we don't actually know where all the data is. A lot of the information is retained by the data creator for many years. Some of it's lost, sadly. It may be deposited in an archive, but we don't necessarily know which archive the information is in. It's been accessioned, catalogued, and available to people. <coughs> and then there's issues about how to use the data. There's a lack of standards in, con in the content. There's different issues about uh, uh, for spatial information projection issues, possibly. and this, We've heard again uh, information about the accuracy and format across projects over time, and we've seen examples of the uh, the difficulty of working with information gathered in the 60s through to the modern day, and it's then further hindered by accessibility, the copyright, the intellectual property rights, and people reluctant to share information, data hoarding. We need to make our information accessible for people to use, otherwise there's no point in gathering that information. Uh, and the information, spatial information has been addressed at European level. We've already heard about the INSPIRE directive. INSPIRE sets down the general rules for establishing an infrastructure of spatial information across Europe uh, for, for um, <coughs> and the purposes of community and environmental policies and making decisions. It's about making information accessible. The main driver for Inspire is the natural environment. If you think about the big uh, flooding issues along the Danube or pollution, that's transnational boundaries, is making information accessible across jurisdiction. The cultural heritage is sort of hanging on on its coattails by, um, by dint of it being part of the environment, but its primary directive is focused on the natural environment. And as far as that's like some very good, good uh, theories, data should be collected once, maintained at the level that can be done most efficiently, effectively. Uh, data should be combined seamlessly, so it's like information standards, so that different so information from different sources may be gathered and shared between organisations. It should be gathered at one level of government and shared between all levels. It's about government, it's about public data, it's not about archaeological data, so for our government, read the profession, and we should be working to make sure our data is, uh, is gathered consistently and shareable. It needs good governance, so it's the rules about access. And it should be easy to be, should be easy to discover. So information has to be accessible, uh, searchable, and discoverable. Uh, and it should be. I work with the Marine Environment Data Information Network. They have a mantra: measure once, use many times. So you get information be gathered at great expense. You should keep it, preserve it, and allow it to be reused without without undue uh, restriction. Uh, the Inspire Directive includes 34 themes organised into three annexes, most of which uh, are weighted towards the natural environment, environmental monitoring, production industrial facilities, agricultural culture, etc. We fit in under protected sites. I'll, go, I'll explain a bit more about what the protected sites clause says in a moment. But we also have interest in elevation through the LIDAR, the remote sensing techniques, auto imagery. Buildings. We heard a bit about BIM yesterday. There's a lot of information that BIM gathers which relates to the buildings theme. And we also have land use, which is our historic land use assessment in Scotland, historic land use characterization, <coughs> characterization in England. There is a relationship between that and the Inspire land use theme which needs to be explored. So, looking at protected sites, um, 
inspires the director of uh, describes a protected, defines a protected site as an area des designated or managed within a framework of international community and member states legislation to achieve specific conservation objectives. And that's then qualified by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which defines it as protected site, especially dedicated to the protection and maintenance of biological diversity and of its natural and associated cultural resources, resources and managed through legal or, and my emphasis, other effective means. So that includes the non-statutory materials. So in Scotland, we have 97%, 93% of the archaeology, cultural heritage of Scotland is in the national record. Only 7% is um, statutorily protected. So the vast majority <coughs> of the information is not formally designated. However, it is managed effectively through planning legislation and guidance and the local authorities spend most of their time dealing with uh, the non-statutory material. So that information is just as valuable as the formally designated records. Inspire, the key to delivering Inspire is spatial data infrastructure. Spatial data infrastructures combine the technology, policies, standards, the human resources, related activities necessary to acquire, process, distribute, and maintain and preserve spatial data. It's about how you organize, serve, manage and um, maintain your data sets. Why do we need a spatial data infrastructure? Uh, so that we can deliver GI-enabled business applications and services for the benefit of society, social, economic, environmental benefits. So it's about making the information accessible for others to use in their own data sets. It's not about how, how we want to manage the data, it's how, we, how people want to use our data. Um, SPAR Directive uh, says um, Existing data held by member states is compliant with INSPIRE standards. There isn't a particularly clear definition of what an INSPIRE standard <coughs> is for the cultural heritage. It's a very narrow term with um, a lot of interpretation that you need to, you can add your own fields and attributions to. Uh, it does not, it technically does not require the creation of new data sets, but it does state that when new data are created, they must comply with INSPIRE standards. So we need to define those standards for cultural heritage. Uh, it requires metadata to allow people to discover the information, view services, web, web map services so that people can view the data, uh, download services so that people can use the services in their own systems, web feature service, that people can interact with the data in their own GIS systems. Uh, and it also outlines char um, policies and charging for public access to service with a, an emphasis on free and open. Uh, there are requirements for monitoring and reporting on SPAR compliance. And it's only about public sector. It doesn't actually address the issues about data that's created by the private sector. However, when that data comes into a, a national archive, it's then, there is then a, an onus and a burden on the national archive to think about its uh, public uh, responsibilities in terms of data. So in terms of publication, uh, in the British Isles, we're very good. We've published a lot of our data in national portals. So we've got the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Uh, the Irish National Monument Service both have portals displaying, showing your data. And the, the Irish Data Service, you can actually download key information from, from that and use that in your own systems. In Wales and Scotland, both, uh, both sites are maintained by Historic Environment Scotland, with PassMap and Historic Wales, which combine data from the designations from <coughs> children monuments, listed buildings, conservation areas, alongside the wider National Canmore Record for Scotland and most, but not all, of the Historic Environment Records in Scotland. And those, those browsers are all searchable by the map. So you use the map, you use map tools to find an area and select information. In England, there's a slightly different approach to the Heritage Gateway, which combines information again from the National Record and the uh, many more local authority records. But there, the primary search tool is terminologies and text-based searches rather than a map interface. Scotland, we, we also publish the data sets in uh, PassMap are also available through other national agencies. So we work with the SEPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, to share web map services or static downloads for their SE web, which combines our data with environmental data sets from other areas of government. We work with Marine Scotland to push our offshore data out through the National Marine Planning Interactive Portal, again, to work with the environment. So people are seeing the data. Why? 
we generally use uh, the static downloads, which means the data is out of date as soon as it's been passed on to the other agency. So we're working towards developing web map services for that agency again to use and take live feeds to ensure that people are making same information and use up to date, accurate as accurate as possible data. Uh, in terms of discovery, um, in Scotland we fill in a spatial uh, Scottish Spatial Data Infrastructure Metadata Catalog, which is a very clunky technical form to ensure that well, our data complies to the, uh, the Inspire documentation. That information is then harvested by data.gov in UK, published in data.gov for offshore data. It's also copied to the Medan uh, Marine Portal, and the data is then in turn um, harvested by the Inspire Geo Portal and it's available searching on uh, the European level. So the one reference created there and it feeds through to these other portals. However, it's very difficult to find anything about heritage information. The portals I showed you from uh, the British Isles, there's no easy way to find where are all the historic environment portals in Europe. Um, so what we need is a dedicated portal for heritage data sets. Perhaps we don't need to reinvent, uh, we don't need to invent something new, but perhaps use existing structures such as, such as the Carrara project and Europeana and work with Europeana to create uh, a way of signposting the national and local authority resources. It's about data sets, not sites, however, so that it's not an easy fit. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a Heritage Gateway uses terminologies as prime prime way of searching information. Inspire has a registry of um, code codes, um, codeless register, and it includes the National Monument Designation uh, Record, which identifies 18 main broad themes, such as domestic, defence, agricultural, subsistence, civil, which happen coincidentally to correspond to the English heritage and now the Forum for Information Standards and Heritage broad terms in their monuments the sort of, and these are available in uh, the various languages, this machine-driven code. So it's about making sure you've got a standard to search across uh, at a very broad level. However, we've been working uh, with partners in the University of South Wales to, to develop uh, linked data through the Sanchal project. So this is an example of a, a linked data record for a <coughs> monument type called a time gate, and three examples from Booth and Bar, the Eastport and Dundee and the Brandenburg Tor. They're all types of gate, a time gate. However, there's no way of searching it. What Seneschal did was to define a concept rather than the term. And in Scotland, we have a multilingual version. So we've got a Gaelic version and an English version that says the concept is a time gate and it can be expressed in English, Gaelic, German, Polish, whatever. And it's by trying to bring those things together, trying to impose those standards to allow people to search across data sets, across European, uh, across uh, data. And there's already work going on on that through the Ariadne work. Package 15 is looking at linking archaeological data. So you know, it's about building on something that's already there and, and extending it to the spatial data sets that we're creating and holding. Why is it important? I've already touched on the idea that we're sharing our information with other portals, the natural environment, SE Web in Scotland. This information is published as web services, web map services, web feature services. People can access that data and it's starting to be used in remote systems, being used without our expertise, our, our input into that information. So we need to think about making our data a bit more robust. This is an example from uh, the Openness Project, which looked at various ecological sites across Europe. And it was using um, something called the uh, there's decision support tools, this case quick scan, so it's taking information and people are putting value and judgment and weighing off. If I introduce more forestry here, what is the impact on the archaeology? So if our data is not visible, people can't make those decisions. So we need to be thinking about how our information is going to be used in the future. We can't expect people to come to our records and, you, and consult us. They're going to expect to access the information remotely through these web map services, web feature services. And again, we heard earlier about, but it's more than just the sites, it's about the information we create, so crop mark uh, transcriptions, remote sensing, the, the laser scanning, field survey excavation, and the scientific analysis all feeds in and contributes to our knowledge of the monuments. 
It's about harmonising gathering, making sure that there's a data flow. And we've heard from Sweden about how to, the, the need to pull together information uh, and rule that information out uh, consistently. So just a schematic level, a project may create uh, various activities from remote sensing, from field survey, excavation. Simple step up, we need to know where did that information take place. So it's not about a spot on the map, it's about where is that trench, where's the location. And that's about the interpretation, process data, and the analysis, and it's about gathering those types of information and coordinating and presenting them as a systematic mapped unit. And the data is it's got to be uh, metadata is going to be specific to the techniques, the geophysical survey. Will have different attribution from the laser scanning, airborne laser scanning, and from terrestrial laser scanning. So we need to understand the spatial data that describes the nature and content of the data set, the exploration <coughs> data that, that allows you to ensure that the data is appropriate for use to, to, to be able to judge is, is the, the resolution sufficient, or do we need to acquire new data, and the exploitation from the metadata about the copyright, the access, the IPR that goes with these things. Um, there's a very good paper by Rob Shaw, Anthony Corns, and John Pauley, looking at the archiving archaeological spatial data standards from CA 2009. Three minutes. Okay, that's fine. By way of an example, we have uh, the National Roads Authority in Ireland has a, a, a map showing the, uh, the, the locations, their, their geophysical surveys along the, the, the motorway extensions that's near Hill of Tara, and you get the attribution, start getting the attribution, and you can link through the PDF. What you're not getting in that map is the spatial extent of the individual survey grids, which is still locked in the PDF. So you want to unlock that information from the PDF and put it in the map. So just to sum up, why do we need a thematic uh, spatial data infrastructure? We're creating a wealth of information, but we're not harmonizing, we're not harvesting it. We're not getting the value from that data. To so take the individual uh, elements of the spatial data infrastructure, We've got resources in abundance. Anyone who's creating information is creating data that can fit in the spatial data, in, uh, spatial data infrastructure. There's a lot of research and development. There's Ariadne, there's the, the um, ARENA project, the ADS we're involved in. There's Europeana. We need to think about the data sets and specifications. We need to think about guidance. There's piecemeal implementation. What we do in Scotland doesn't translate to what happens in England. Doesn't, have, uh, doesn't translate to what's going on in Spain. Spain have developed their own cultural heritage model for, for <coughs> spatial data and different approaches again in Sweden, Poland. Um, just skipping through, but we need to think more about our interoperability standards, the CDOT, CRM, and the Europeana EDM models. <coughs> what we don't have the, the requisite policies and legal framework. There's INSPIRE, which says general, you must do this, but there's no sectorial framework what we're definitely lacking is a, a lack of coordinating body and a lack of coordinated approach. So just to finish off, just leave you the question, if OpenStreetMap can do it, create a, a map for, for the world, basically it's open source and free, why can't we harmonise, create our data? Uh, it's a lot simpler information. We are already got the tools, we're, not, we're just not thinking in terms of spatial information anymore. We think about individual projects. Thank you. Thank you.